Morning, God first for always so glad that you're joining us this morning um, I just want to let you know that we miss you we love you um, my family and I are praying for you wherever you are we are praying that God continues to shower you with his presence we miss you we love you and we cannot wait to have you back in church with us if you are visiting us for the first time so glad that you you're joining us we are always praying that God sends us new people and I am glad that you have decided to join us virtually this morning. Please, I want to encourage you to visit our website at G14ways um, and send us a note. Uh, we would love to get in touch with you, find out a bit more about what you need and how we can help. Um, so drop us a note at g14ways.coza and we will be in touch with you during, during the week. Um, I pray that this will be a good time for worship. I pray that you, you will meet God this morning. I pray that you will enjoy service with us today. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Cause our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Yeah. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you. 
none like you Cause our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer awesome and power Our God Our God our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God is for us, and who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Oh, oh, oh. then what could stand Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, yeah, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, Awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God, and if our God is for us, then it could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against. stand against yeah, yeah. yeah Lord Jesus we want to thank you that you are the great King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that there is nobody who is as strong as you we're so grateful, Lord, that the only thing equal to your infinite power is your infinite love for us. And so we know that you're going to use your strength for our good. And so we're grateful and we pour our praise and worship upon you right now. God is able. He will never fail. God, greater than all we seek, greater than all we ask, He has done great things, lifted up, He defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, and in His name overcome for the Lord our God is able for the Lord our God is able God is with us God is on our side He will make a way far above all
in his name we overcome for the Lord our God is able for the Lord our God is able God is with us he will go before Defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, and in his name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord holy spirit you are glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord Holy Spirit you and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord Lord we thank you for your Holy Spirit, we thank you for your, for your presence. Um, we pray that um, you continue to remind us that your Holy Spirit is with us and that the truth um, is seared in our hearts and we hold on to it uh, through this time. You're joining us in the middle of our series through Psalms. AJ is going to be preaching to us this morning. I pray that you will find joy and that this preacher will be a blessing to you this morning. I'll see you on the other side. Great church. Well, it's uh, just so exciting to be here talking to you. I know that you're all at home in your pajamas, on the couch, ready for church this morning. You got your cup of coffee and it's uh, uh, and you're looking and feeling great. I can almost see you as I look into the cameras this morning. So welcome to church. We're in a series which is called uh, kind of praying through difficulty. We're going to be looking uh, through the books of Psalm and this morning you're catching me uh, in Psalm 62 and the kind of title that I've given it is waiting and pouring. Great title, isn't it? Well, you're going to have to wait just for us to unpack that a little bit more. But this uh, is a psalm written by David. And David kind of is that guy who, uh, as a youth, killed Goliath. So he's, he's got a big reputation. In fact, God uh, even himself refers to David as the man after God's own heart, the man after his heart. 
And so David has this big persona, this big reputation, but in this context where he's writing this particular psalm, David is in this uh, difficult situation. Uh, he has, Saul has just died, the previous king. He's been made king. Uh, Samuel anointed him and he's become king. But um, Saul's children and the followers of, of King Saul have kind of set apart their king. And so there's two kings in the, uh, in the kingdom uh, and there's kind of a civil war. There's unrest. There's, there's a lot of fighting going on. There's a lot of jostling, political positioning and, and kind of even, you know, if you read through the book of Samuel, you'll see there's kind of people getting killed in bed and, and, and all kinds of things going and David writes this psalm in the context and the messiness uh, and the unrest uh, of his life here. So I want to kind of take this psalm and I want to say, you know, let's, let's, how does David respond to God and, and what can we learn from him this morning that will help us in the context of our lives today? And so I've asked Jojo, a friend of mine, to read this scripture for us. And uh, so Jojo, take us away. Read Psalm 62 for us. Psalm 62 For God alone my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low state are but a breath. Those of high state are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. And that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to man according to his work. So I just love this particular psalm. It's, it's really, as I've gone through it, it's, it's really ministered to me. It's given me great strength as I look through it. And so it, it comes across in, in kind of three separate blocks. And I've, I've named those three blocks, waiting, pouring, and receiving. And so what I want to do is look at it in the context of that. And I'm going to start with waiting for God as, as our first kind of look at this. And David is, is under pressure, as I said earlier, and he's, he's dealing with unrest. He's He's kind of um, dealing with uh, kind of the uncertainty, the pressure, different people, the jostling that's going on. And so in that context, I guess we're not too different today. We're, we're living in lockdown. Uh, we are dealing with all kinds of pressures that we haven't dealt with. Maybe financial difficulties, job security, maybe losing a job, finding food, or just surviving the day to day. Our lives at the moment are upside down. I think we can relate to David uh, in the situation and circumstance that he was facing when he wrote that. And so what can we learn this morning from David and how can he help us uh, in our day-to-day -day living right now? And so looking at the first four verses, this kind of idea of waiting on God, let's just read through these verses and, and let's see how God unpacks this and how David kind of speaks of the greatness of God. And so verse one, it says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. And I love the way that David is kind of just got self-talk going on. So as he comes into this, immediately he's reminding himself of who God is. And he takes it on to the next level. And as he carries on in these Psalms and he says, He alone is my rock and my salvation. You can just hear the, 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 the excitement or the kind of reminding it as, as the energy of, of what he's saying kind of hits his heart. And he reminds himself, it starts to lift him. You are my fortress, he says. I shall not be greatly shaken. So he's shaken just a little bit. You know, uh, not greatly, but just a little bit shaken. And, this. and as it goes on, some commentaries kind of refer to this next passage, not as just um, David kind of reflecting on himself and feeling, woe is me, but he's, he's more uh, actually taunting those who are coming at after him, those who are uh, pushing in on him. And he says the following things. How long? Will all of you attack a man to batter him, 
like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence, <laughs> he says, uh, they only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood and um, they bless with their mouths, but they curse or inwardly they curse. And so David's taking these people and he's kind of identifying and saying, listen, really, in the context of who my God is, the greatness, the fortress, the rock of who he is, who are these people? They don't even, you know, they're not even true to themselves. Outwardly, they're kind of saying blessings, but inwardly, they're cursing. These are nothing. And so David's kind of taken this and he's, uh, he's kind of um, wrestling with God in these things. But what he does, first and foremost, as he opens this passage, is that he lifts his gaze to who God is. And I love this uh, kind of opening line that he uses here. And for me, it's the showstopper of this particular psalm. And he says this, For God alone my soul waits in silence. Under pressure and the places that we live, I think it's just unnatural to kind of wait in anything. This is Joburg, baby. We are fast. It's furious. It's the way we work. But he says he waits. But wait, that's not all he says. He says he waits in silence. Now, that's not something that kind of happens easily uh, in this day and age. I think when, uh, if we listen to uh, Nikki's preach from, from last week, when there are things uh, busying our minds, we tend to just want to throw other things at our minds. We want to be distracted. We would probably, when we're feeling under pressure, go to TV, uh, uh, find a TV show or series that we like to try and dial out. We would go for a run, put our earphones in and, and just keep the, the noise coming uh, in, our, in our minds. Maybe we would go shopping. Maybe we would just see a friend and maybe even you are thinking of, listen, I'll even mow the lawn. Just don't leave me alone with my thoughts. But the beauty of this is that David takes the bull firmly by the horns. He turns to face God alone. Nothing else. He turns to face God alone and he waits in silence for God. And I just think there's such a strong, powerful uh, kind of picture of how to engage when we're under pressure, where we need to turn when we're under pressure. When lost in the craziness of your life, have you taken a moment or to wait in silence for God? I know that in my life, this would take quite a lot of determination. Um, so the question is, how does David do that? How does David kind of um, quieten himself? How does David kind of take his thoughts and off the immediate pressures and stress that he is under and turn them to God. And I think it's in that very same sentence uh, that he says to himself, for God alone my soul waits um, in silence. From him comes my salvation. That is such a powerful statement. From him comes my salvation. God, you are my salvation. If you reword salvation, God, you are my rescue. You are my escape. Aren't those helpful language? Isn't that kind of helpful pictures? God, you are my escape. You're my rescue. Where do I turn? I turn to my rescuer. That makes sense. I turn to you, God, and, and that's how David approaches this. He stops, he waits, he, he's, he quietens himself to say, Lord, rescue me. You are my rescue. I'm looking to you. As we face COVID-19, as we look at salary cuts, as we look at uh, lack of food or food shortages, depression or loneliness, or even just another day of homeschooling, God and God alone is your rescue. David's calling us out to wait in silence. Wait for God. Don't tell him what to do. He's God. Wait for God. Just wait. He is a living God looking to engage with you, looking to, to hear your heart and hear what you have to say. Now, I know you're going to think, listen, age, that's all very nice and theoretical. In my own life, I've had to pause of <laughs> recently just in the last kind of, uh, it's five years, but in the last three years, work has become untenable. The, the, the pressure of moving from a family-owned business to a New York-listed entity, the cultural shifts 
uh, the economic downturns, and me as the sales manager leading the front end of this organization, trying to provide for 50 families that we support uh, and, and our customers' needs. Um, all of these shifts have weighed in on me, have just been a huge pressure to try find solutions, try be creative, try and help uh, develop these things. And as, I, as I'm failing to deliver what people are expecting from me, I've been hemmed in, hemmed in, and hemmed in to feel like I'm under pressure. And there's been a moment lately where I've just had to stop and say, God, I can't. I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm failing everyone in this situation. I'm not able to deliver the things that we are promising. I'm not able to make these things happen. Lord, would you, would you rescue me? And it's, a, it's a kind of like I'm taking my hands off. I need you now more than ever. And there's a moment where you just sit there, you have no words, you sit in silence, and you wait. I don't have any quick fixes, but there's this moment of power when you acknowledge that God is your rescuer. So David takes this powerful concept of self-talk. Now, self-talk is completely normal. I just want to say you're fine with that. You're all good. It's when you start answering yourselves. Then we have to talk a little bit more uh, just to express that, and there may be some professionals that can help us. But self-talk is a good thing. And David uses it to such power in this time of pressure that he is under. He says, for God alone, my soul waits. It's my soul that waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He's talking to himself. He alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken, he says. And he, he takes these things and it almost fires him up as he talks. Now, this isn't the, 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 the raw, raw, emotional uh, building up. This is, AJ, remember this is who God is. AJ, remember God is your rock, your fortress. This is bringing truth back into view. This is bringing the truth of who God is and, and what you know and understand and you squeeze it in and you put it front and center of your life. You talk to yourself and you remind yourself. And as David does that, he, he feels the energy of God. He's reminded again of who God is and that emboldens him to go after the people who are mocking him that are looking to take his life and dethrone him from the kingdom. How long, he says, will you, uh, uh, sorry, will all of you attack a man to batter him uh, like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down um, from his high position. You know, he's, he's, he's calling them out. Uh, and, and at the end of this, he's kind of, you know, you're blessed with your mouths, but inwardly you curse. And what he's saying is, listen, you guys have nothing. There's no substance to you. I am on the rock. This is who God's made him. And you can see this as we go into the next part, uh, or, or, or next kind of block of this particular psalm. David's uh, revving up and changing gear here, and he moves into the section which I've called pouring out to God. And listen to these next few verses as David starts to pour out, as he starts to take what we've already just learned of self-talk, and he ups the game. He says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. So he's still talking to himself here. He only is my rock. So he's kind of like, not only God is my rock, now God only. He's defining it for himself. He is only my rock. I'm looking nowhere else. He is my salvation, my rescuer. He is my fortress. And then he takes it up again because he says here, I will not be shaken. Remember just now he was just saying, listen, I won't be greatly shaken. I'll just be a little bit shaken. Now he's saying, forget it. All bets are off. I'm not shaken anymore. He's taking this, uh, this thing on and he says, go, uh, go, on God rests my salvation and my glory. Do you hear the change in language? Uh, just the fact that uh, it's now moving to the fact that it's, he's looking for glory. It's, uh, he, he's not just looking at surviving, but he's looking at victory uh, as he speaks to these things. He's saying, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. David has defined it. David has said, God, here you come. It's front and center for me. This is who you are. And so then David kind of unlocks the psalm for me. Uh, as he talks about in verse 8, how do I engage God? And this, this psalm is, is, is where it all pivots because 
uh, up until now, he's talking to himself, he's reminding himself, he's, he's getting filled up. But in Psalm 8, something shifts, something breaks with him. It's no longer just about him, but he starts to speak out to others. And he says, trust in him. <laughs> at all times, O oh people. So it's not about himself anymore, but O oh people. He's speaking it out. He says, pour out your hearts uh, before him. And he says, God is a refuge for us, the people. Do you see the changes that happens as, as David self-talks uh, to himself, but then he starts to transition uh, to this amazing moment where he's no longer talking to himself. God has so secured him on who he is. He has built so purposefully on this rock and this salvation now. David is able to lead. David is, uh, is able to speak out, and he wants to take people with him on this great journey uh, that God has got him on here. Trusting God, which is what he says here, uh, is probably the understandable portion, but then he goes on to say something that is probably something that we don't think about every day. He says, pour out your heart before him. This is kind of something that, uh, you know, what, what does it mean to pour out your heart? You know, and, and I think what David's getting at here in this, when you're living under pressure, your heart is filled with fear. Your heart is filled with anxiety and frustration and even sometimes frustration with God. And David's saying, pour it out. David's saying, listen, don't keep it bottled up. Don't keep it in. Pour that out. And where do you pour it? You pour it on me. You bring that stuff to me. It's important that you bring it uh, on my side. So pour those things out. And later we're going to talk about it's not just pouring those things out. It's not just emptying yourself out for that, but then it's filling. Once you've emptied out all those things, uh, we get to fill ourselves. But right now we're talking about David saying, pour your heart out to God. God is big enough to take those things on that you pour out. God uh, is not burdened by your needs. You don't have to feel ashamed about that. In fact, God loves it when you bring it. And even if you're angry with God, He loves it when you come to Him. I, I would even encourage you, wave your fists at God, get frustrated with Him, let it out. Let Him know exactly what it is that you're thinking and doing these things. And you know what? Uh, when you get angry like that, God loves it because you're engaging. I think Nikki spoke about it last week. He said that relationship is a two-way street. He can't help you if you don't express what it is that's frustrating. It doesn't help that you keep this polished Christian facade uh, going here, but inside you're dying. God is big enough. And when you vent at God and you wave your fist and you do that, you know what? It's not for God. He's not the one that needs help. It's for you. And you venting, it's for your help to understand what you need with God. And He loves that. He loves that when we come to Him. He's not ashamed. He's not shy. He loves it when we engage with God. And so we need to do that. Um, we need to go to God and we need to ask Him for help uh, in these situations. And I think the most powerful part for me that, that kind of underlines why that is so important, why not bottling it up, don't wait for it to get pretty or try and figure out your emotions, just bring it raw, bring it neat. And this is the reason why. 1 Peter 5 says the following, Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time He may exalt you. And then here it is, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Just an amazing picture of the, of the fact that we get to cast our anxieties. The Bible says it here. We can do that. We can offload on God. Anxieties are not pretty. They are things that worry. They are stuff that is, that is taken and taking hold of our hearts. But that's not the crux of the matter. The next verse is the real heart of this. It says, be sober-minded and be watchful. Church, we need to be watchful for these anxieties in our hearts and as they start to take root. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And he's the guy that plugs in his pump and he takes that anxiety, he blows it up and blows it up until it's something that really looks massive. All it takes is one pin to pop it in there. God deflates that and it levels that out again. And those anxieties, which were these big mountains and things, that's a facade. That's how the devil works. He, he wants you to feel overwhelmed by those things. But as God, and as we hand them to God, and as He intervenes in the situation, He shows them for what they are. He pulls the plug out. He, he just deflates all of that. And amazingly, the view changes. The perspective changes on what it is that is happening in our lives and who it is, the rock, that we have this great foundation. And God becomes front and center 
uh, to us uh, in this area. And I just think, you know, this is what we have to do. We have to wait on God. We have to pour out our hearts. When last did you pour out your heart to God? If I look back at the few years that I've been alive and I look through the milestones of my life and just how God has brought me through things, I can honestly uh, give you a number of accounts where there's been moments where my life has kind of stopped at God and I've waited with Him and I've poured out my heart to Him in a situation or a circumstance. And one that comes to mind for me is just, I remember at school, I'd just uh, been to the principal's office. Him and I were friends. <laughs> I went there a lot. But this time he had told me, listen, Andrew, you have failed again. <laughs> uh, it wasn't the first time, it wasn't the second time. And it really, for the first time, impacted me. I was probably getting to that age where I knew that school was vital to getting a job. And job was vital to having a family, to getting married, having kids, and even economically or socially being able to be something or be someone. And at that young, tender age, for the first time, it really um, became very real to me that actually I might not succeed. And I, I remember I was, uh, I, went, I was at boarding school for most of my career. I remember sitting down next to the tennis courts and pouring out my heart to God. God, I, I don't have anything to offer you. I'm not succeeding in this. The measurements that people have put around me, I'm failing on every level. I have nothing to offer you, but whatever I have, I give it to you. And there was a, a real moment of pouring on my heart, a, a moment that I can tell you what I was wearing, what I was doing. It just, it, it, in, it encapsulated my life at that moment. And even today, as I take stock of who I am today, as I take stock of the 25 years of my career, as I consider the beautiful wife my three children, the career that I've had, and I think back to that tennis court moment with God, I'm so grateful for what He's done. He took that, that I didn't have anything to give, He took it, and He's fashioned it into something which only can be God, who can do something like that. And it's, it's a real uh, anchor, it's a real rock uh, to go back to these moments and, and be reminded what it is that, that God can do in our lives. And that strengthens us as we go on. That's my story. There are two more stories that I just want to share with you about pouring out your heart. And, and the next one is, is really Hannah. And just um, this Hannah's life is, um, has not been easy up until this point. She's basically a wife. So she's married. She's not able to have children. And in those social circumstances, having children was, uh, was really a social status. It was really important. It was part of the cultural kind of legacy. And so she started to feel the pressure of the ridicule of the society. Her friends around them all had children. She didn't. You know, she went to the market. She didn't have this family unit that everybody else did. She started to, it started to press in on her, the anxiety, the, the mocking that would come from those things. She stopped eating. She, it, it says she stopped eating. She, she, um, she felt sick. Um, you know, and this, you could just see, was leading into frustration within her, and she was broken. But she did what David did. She went to God with her problems. She went to the temple, uh, and she went in there, and she started to pour out her heart. And here it is. Samuel, 1 Samuel 1.10 says, She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And this is what she was doing. She poured out her heart to God. In fact, Eli, the priest, obviously hasn't seen much of that kind of action before uh, in the temple. And he made the natural assumption, Ah, she must be drunk. Let's address it. And this is how Hannah responds to Eli. Um, he says, but, uh, but Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a woman uh, troubled in spirit. Isn't that reassuring to hear? The people in the Bible were troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. You could see what our identity was at that moment, worthless woman. For all along, I have been speaking out of a great anxiety and vexation. 
So it's just amazing how she starts to offload this anxiety to God. You see it in that. In that moment, Hannah poured out her whole life. Her life changed. The next verses just say that she left, that she went and ate, and that her face was no longer sad. Had her circumstances changed yet? No. But she was changed. The peace of God had come in. She knew that the problem wasn't hers anymore. She had put it in God's hands. Sure. Later, the Bible always says this, and we, uh, we always chuckle when we read it, you know, in due time, whatever that means, she had a child. In fact, she had a number afterwards. But her firstborn, uh, she named Samuel. Two books in the Bible uh, were written about him. And I guess the, the trick question or a thought for us is if she hadn't poured out her heart, would we have had Samuel? What are the things that if we pour our hearts out, that hearts out to God about, would God resurrect, would bring to us things that would, would mark history if we want to go big uh, in these kind of areas? So you kind of have this thing, AJ, listen, you poured out your heart, Hannah poured out your heart, you guys got what you wanted. Uh, you know, so if I pour out my heart, does God give me what I ask for? I want to read a, a second passage or tell you a second story. And this one's in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this is Jesus. And he's pouring his heart out to his father, saying, Father, listen, if you could take this away from me, because he's about to go to the cross, if you can take this away, if there's any way, if please, if there's any way you could take this away, please do it. And let's read Luke 22, 42. It says here, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus poured out his heart to God. And God did not change his plan. But in that came one of the greatest gifts that we could ever have imagined. So David in the psalm is kind of talking about uh, waiting and pouring, but he doesn't want to just stop at waiting and pouring. He wants to uh, ask us to move on to the third step, which is kind of receiving from God. So as you've poured out your life, as you've poured out all these anxieties and things, you are now open to receive from God. You, the, the, there's space, the anxieties have moved away, and there's space to receive from God. And the way that David positions it in this psalm, I just think is, is so powerful because he goes right after our motives. And if I look at the motives that he highlights, there could have been many, but he highlights these few. I think as Joburg is today, this speaks to us. Maybe as I read it, see if it means anything or stands out for you as a Joburger. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of a high estate are a delusion. In the balance, they go up. And in those days, everything was, uh, value was measured in a scale. You put weights in this side, and basically if they measured up, in this, in this uh, psalm, David's saying, as I put the weights on, poof, this actually has no weight at all, no value at all. In fact, he goes on to say that. They are brought together, they are lighter than breath. And what he's talking about in lower state and higher state, he's talking about the poor. So whether you are poor or higher state, whether you are rich, wealthy, or successful, they have nothing. On the balances of God's scale, they have nothing. They're like a breath. They weigh nothing to us. And so David is just highlighting again, this social standing within God doesn't have any weight, no value. And he goes on to say, put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, woohoo! Set not your heart on them. And I think as Joe Burgers and as in the fast pace that we're living, this motivation that David goes for goes straight to the heart of who we are. Straight to the heart. And he goes on to say, once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, which just means this is awesome. Listen up quickly. That God, sorry, it says, but um, that power belongs to God. So this is the crux of it, that he wants us to, that this truth, he wants us to focus our gaze on, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. And David's asking us to shift our motivation. As we've poured ourselves up, he wants us to fill up uh, on these two truths. All power belongs to God, 
That's where you get your strength from. And he wants to say, God is steadfast in love. That's where we get our confidence from. We look at these uh, mighty rock, the rock of who God is, the salvation that is we're giving. We find our strength and we find our confidence in that. Nothing else. Success, riches, poor, whatever that is, those weigh nothing in this. Our strength comes from God. And then the last line of this particular psalm, um, David kind of puts his parting words in, and they are sobering uh, in the context of this. And he says, for you, talking about God, for you will render to a man according to his works. And we've just spoken about where the motivation of our hearts are. But he says to a man, you will uh, um, render a man to his works. And, and just this, this topic of works, this is a real um, kind of sobering thought for us. Because outside of God, our, our works are worthless. Our works are <laughs> weigh nothing in the scale. God's the one, and the works we do for God are what bring the value into these things. And it reminds me of, of Romans 6.23, where it just talks about the wages of sin is death. And, and wages are something that you've earned. So if your boss, you work for your boss, uh, you're entitled to the wages for working those hours. And, and just like us, if we've done sin, the wages uh, the, the, the value or, or what we've earned um, is death. So for sins, that's death. And I'm so grateful this, that verse doesn't stop there, but it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And the power of this this morning uh, is the fact that eternal life, if we say it's this card, uh, is the gift, this free gift, but it's in Christ Jesus. So if we say this is the gift and we want to wrap it in Christ Jesus, we say, here we go, here's eternal life. It's wrapped in Christ Jesus. If you want to receive this gift of eternal life, you have to take Jesus. You have to receive Jesus. And so if this is a free gift that I want to give to you, when does this gift become yours? It's a great question. This gift becomes yours when you receive it. And that's exactly what God is offering us. This is the promise that God has given to all of us, that he has given us this gift of eternal life, but it's in Christ Jesus. There's a gift that he wants to give us. And so with this kind of gift that he has, it even goes on one step further in Revelations 3.20. It just says that I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And God wants to, has this promise of relationship uh, with him, as Nikki spoke about last week. Just this relationship and this openness, honesty, and as we talk about waiting, pouring, and receiving from him, there's this activity that comes from a living God. If you want to receive this living God into your life to help you build on value and on rock, and you want him to be your escape and your rescue and your salvation, then pray this prayer with me right now wherever you are. Say this, Lord, I've sinned and I've earned death. Jesus, I want to invite you into my heart and to make you Lord of my life. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross in my place for my sins. Please forgive me for my sins. Come and live in my heart. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'd love you to make contact with us on our website. Just uh, look us up, drop us a note. We've got some uh, literature we'd love to give you, uh, and we'd love to kind of walk a journey with you. If you're just still considering that question and, and, and now you're thinking, drop us a note as well. We'd love to walk a journey with you and unpack some of these things uh, with you as we look at who Christ is. And I want to finish up right here at Romans 5. Uh, where it's this, this encouragement to us about what happens when we see challenges and how we push through. And it says this in the Message Bible. There is more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in uh, with troubles. But we know how troubles can develop passionate, oh, per, uh, passionate patience in us. Don't you just like that? Passionate patience in us. And how this patient, in return, forges tempered steel of virtue in us, keeping us, and I love this, uh, 
keeping us alert for whatever God is going to do next. And in this alert expectation such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Never, guys. Quite the contrary. We, can, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours out into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Waiting on God, pouring ourselves out and receiving from Him. Let's respond uh, in this next song uh, this morning and let's take a moment for God. The Lord bless you and keep you Make His face shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn His face toward you.
Thank you for that preach, AJ. That was so encouraging. There is no better place to end than with all power belongs to God and He loves us. I hope that you, found, you find strength in that. I pray that that truth becomes a part of who you are throughout this period. Thank you once again for joining us. Please feel free to visit. I want to encourage you, in fact, I want to encourage you to visit g14ways.co.za. We would love to pray with you. If you need prayer, if you need encouragement, we are there for you and we would love to pray for you. Please visit us at g14ways. Drop us a note and we'll be in touch with you this week.